Welcome back Mint to Easton, your Mint Condition, a channel to visit in order to be part of a community and lay claim to some comic book knowledge. I'm your host, The Astonishing Melanie, and today I will be reviewing Spider-Man Bloodline, so please stay tuned. Spider-Man Bloodline is not only the first comic written by J.J. Abrams, but he co-wrote it also with his son Henry, and the arts by Sarah Pacelli, and the color by Dave Stewart. Just want to quickly say thank you to the folks at Marvel and David Gabriel for sending us this review copy. It collects the five issue miniseries published last year. This review will be time stamped for two sections, a spoiler free story analysis and look at the art and a spoiler section. And with this spoiler free section, I do need to hit upon specifics from the first issue of this uh, non-canon story. Okay, it's like an alternate universe. The authors drop the reader into the heat of battle where Peter Parker is fighting Cadaverous, the new villain with a really cool name. Mary Jane is trying to get Peter up and out of harm's way, but she suffers a fatal blow. And of course, she's thrown off a bridge. Very dramatic and heartfelt though, so the intro grabbed my attention. And then we see their three-year-old son, Ben, at the funeral. Skip forward 12 years. <laughs> And we see that Aunt May has been raising Ben while Peter Parker is working a, as a reporter on foreign assignments. We're introduced to Ben's external conflicts. He definitely doesn't get along with his father. He argues that he should stand up for what's right, while Peter argues that Ben is not above the rules. Keep in mind that he's also a freshman who is developing spider power. So, you know, you got the whole teenage body changing thing going as well. Finally, Peter's internal conflict is feeling guilty because he didn't save Mary Jane, and he figures that Ben is better off without him. A new character, Faye Ito, is introduced in a meet-cute, first time I've got to use that phrase, by the way, I just learned it like two weeks ago, and Ben is very sly and quick-witted with his method of flirting with the new girl who has green paint splattered on her face and clothes, and she also stands up for what's right, which he's definitely attracted to. To sum it up, the authors explore one of the greatest themes of Spider-Man. With great power comes, you know you want to say it with me, great responsibility. I hope you said it along with me and somebody in the room is like, what are you shouting that for? The next generation is firmly standing on the maxim and the old generation lost his faith years ago. So that's definitely a cool thing to hit upon. However, in terms of characterization in this story, Aunt May is not herself. She gives Ben his father's suit after he's developed powers without a hint of anxiety or advice. Here you go. She's a plot device, a way for Peter to safely flee from Ben and a way for Ben to find out Peter's secret. This is one of the reasons that Bloodline feels like a fanfic. I mean, it is an alternate universe, but um, I'm thinking that's, that's the way to approach it. Now time for spoilers, so hit the timestamp to jump to the look at the art if you want to continue spoiler free. Obviously Ben dons the suit, but at first it's for a girl. Faye is The Marker, a costume graffiti artist, which is a way for her to be in the mix of the story and give Peter the help he needs with the whole new hero gig experience. I really like one of her lines. She flips the Spidey code upside down by declaring that we all have a great responsibility and we're powerful because of that. That's pretty cool. I got a little bit of goosebumps again. Not enough to show though, sorry. Peter is kidnapped by Cadaverous and we find out that this villain needed him all those years ago to bring his love back from the dead. His blood is the key. Faye takes Ben with her to Stark Industries to get some help and they meet Riri. They find that Tony has been living in his basement in guilt, no explanation why, but he snaps out of it to help them rescue his friend. Two story points that aren't explained is why Thor, the Hulk, Black Widow, and Captain America are dead. I just would like to know, like just a throwaway sentence. What? What killed him? And why the villain brings these superheroes back from the dead to fight Ben and the others. Like, how did he know that they were going after him? He wrote Ben off as not a threat when he took Peter. Cadaverous successfully brings his love back from the dead and she turns into a monster spider like you do. Here's an example of a problem with timing between panels and the balance of humorous lines. 
Peter is on the operating table making a joke about being naked. I feel like that joke would fit better in a moment where he was more out of danger than in it. I mean, he has tubes stuck in his abdomen and he's been traumatized. In the next panel, he's already strapped down and the woman is withdrawing his blood. The two set a trap for Ben with Peter's bait to obtain his blood because they can't get enough out of Peter. So I'm like, how much do they need? How much blood do they need to create a healing serum? If he doesn't have enough blood for that, then he shouldn't be alive. <laughs> but Ben escapes her clutches with the help of one of the villain's minions and somehow knows exactly the right wire to pull out of its head to keep it from writhing in agony. He says it's because it's Stark technology and he's seen it before, but the authors didn't give any clues or foreshadowing that Ben inherited his father's brain. They rejoin the battle that's still raging with the giant spider. It must have been a long fight. Ben tries to save his father with the serum he stole from Cadaverous, but after Peter realizes that the villain's minion is Mary Jane, he injects her with it instead. So Mary Jane is back to life, which I like that part. They mourn for one page, and with the last page, Aunt May works her magic again by being a character that presents both of them with Tony's gift, new spider suits. Because Mary Jane now has spider powers due to the serum. You know, as I just went through that synopsis with the analysis sprinkled in, I felt like there were a lot of points that I had to hit over and over. So maybe that's an indicator of the story being a little too convoluted. I don't know. It's just something that I realize as I'm going through it. Now, let's take a look at the art. So here we have the standard edition cover, which I like immensely more than the direct market version. This cover is done by Oliver Coipel. I love this color. I love their poses. Mary Jane looks strong. It's cool that she's like swinging with him, reaching out with her arm as opposed to clinging for dear life. I don't know. I like it. There. As I mentioned earlier, that we are thrown into the battle. Here's Mary Jane trying to help and just look at that. That's so intense. I also enjoy the backgrounds with the streaks of white against the dark. It's used late. That technique is used later on as well with um, different colors. Always love it when it's the silhouette against one solid color for a dramatic moment. There she goes off the bridge. <laughs> Sorry, Mary Jane. I like her shoes falling. That's just a cool detail. And here we have little Ben at the funeral and their facial expressions matching the dead look in their eyes. I like the angles of the panels. He's just going step by step, like taking steps throughout his day. And of course, he's going to stand up to the bully. Here they are arguing about standing up to said bully. We see that Peter has lost a hand those 12 years ago. And um, their word balloons are layered over each other because they're talking over each other. Nice detail. I like how Pacelli flipped this around so that we can see this side eye that he's smirking to himself, knowing that he's doing really well with this girl. I find it interesting that he's not just evil plotting sitting there mastermind but he's eating like a weenie what well, uh, <laughs> it's just weird <laughs> definitely the use of red is prominent throughout the story i like peter's long hair of course i get why it's he's got this disheveled look however if he's honing his job as a reporter on foreign assignments you'd think he would be a little bit more clean cut than that so here we have aunt may just saying, sweetheart, and uh, hey, go check this out. And that's all the advice I'm going to give you. And there we go. Again, the use of the background with the, the splotches and the, and the streaks. Here's the direct market cover by Chip Kid. Some variant covers by Sarah Pacelli and Dave Stewart. And others as well. So what I'm thinking is that if Marvel and the authors stretch the story into six issues, the timing and characterization would improve. It started out strong, and then too much was packed into the rest of the series. There were issues with timing between panels and the balance of using 
quirky, humorous lines during fights while not overdoing it and dampening the suspense. I give Pacelli's unique art style an 8 out of 10. Love the sketchiness in Spider-Man's movement. However, the story I uh, give a 5 out of 10. My suggestion is to treat it as a fanfic. And let me say that I appreciate the fact that J.J. Abrams created a story with his son. It's a special experience. I was Lydia's editor on the Warrior Cats fanfic that she was writing, but she lost interest. And I need to light a fire under her butt. I also love creating content with my husband for this channel. So on that note, consider subscribing if you enjoy our content and hit the like button so YouTube will notify others of our existence. Thank you to all our supporters on Patreon and stay minty.